Welcome back. Mr. King here with progressive lecture number four. And today, the goal really, as you can see here, of, of the lecture will be to talk about President Taft in his four-year term and his achievements as a progressive president. Uh, talk about the exciting election of 1912, which was a four-way race, so that is wrong. Talk about uh, two new political ideologies, new nationalism and new freedom. And then to talk about really the crowning moment of the progressive mo movement, I feel, uh, with President Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, and his achievements. And there's a rather lengthy list of achievements. And I think this was the, the, the high point of the progressive movement. And Wilson served from 1913 to 1921. So if the movement began sometime in the 1890s, it's going to end with uh, Wilson's presidency, uh, 1921. And in large part, I think that's because these movements of intense action and aggressive reform have a natural lifespan. They, they, they peak, um, they develop, they rise, they peak, and then there's this sort of denouement, to borrow a term from literature. So they burn out. And I think that's exactly what happened. And also the onset of World War I, an extremely destructive war that tore apart the roots of civilization and questioned um, all efforts of humankind to live according to certain values and live up to those values, uh, I think really kind of explains why progressives, progressivism ended. So today we're going to look at the achievements, the high moments, the high peaks, if you will, of the progressive movement under Taft and then under President Wilson. So let's get started and we'll take a look first at Taft. Let me see if I can get this to advance. Uh, there we go. So in the screen, you can see President William Taft. He was a rather large, rotund man, over 300 pounds, one of our largest presidents, but that's on a side. doesn't really matter. He was an intelligent, quiet, and calm person, and he behaved that way as president. So he was very, very different from President Theodore Roosevelt, who was a very loud, boisterous, uh, active, robust speaker uh, who used what was called the bully pulpit to get his message across to the people. Taft did not do any of this, and, and I think consequently he was not as popular, he was not as well known, and certainly not as well liked uh, by the American people because he never really was able to connect with the, the American people. However, nonetheless, we can look at some of the things he did following President Roosevelt, and he's really known primarily as a trust buster. So that's up there as point number one. He attacked large trust to restore freedom to the American economy. He went after two of the largest trusts at the time, the American Tobacco Trust and Standard Oil, which was John Rockefeller's trust. And both those trusts were going to be broken up as a result of federal lawsuits that were brought against them. Taft increased the national forest acreage uh, which was a good thing, and that's something that Roosevelt really took great pride in, was the conservation of the environment and the careful use of the environment. However, Taft uh, angered and upset a lot of people because of his um, work with coal companies and allowing coal companies to use public lands to extract those resources. And so a lot of people then felt that Taft was not reliable, that he had gone back on his words and gone against what President Roosevelt had started. Taft looked into, um, looked at the idea of child labor very seriously and created the Children's Bureau, which was to protect against child labor. So I think that's a fairly straightforward and obvious one. And lastly, he signed laws that improved mining safety. Uh, you know, one could argue that there were a lot of uh, unsafe and dangerous jobs, steel mills, the rail, uh, railroads, on and on and on, um, that, that deserved protection and regulation. Um, Taft singled out the mining industry and, and promoted uh, mine safety. Um, what was really going to get Taft into trouble uh, during his presidency was uh, a dispute over the tariff. Now, We've, we often forget about tariffs. They're not terribly exciting to many, but tariffs at the time were really one of the only ways the U.S. government raised money for itself to fund its operations. And we know from the recent government shutdown that funding for the federal national government is a big deal. It's a big issue. And so the tariff was a way that the United States government 
could collect this money. And the tariffs throughout the 1880s and 1890s into the early 1900s had been very, very, very high. And that was, again, to raise money. But there's another thing that tariffs do that we often overlook, and that is they protect American businesses. Because remember, you might be asking, well, Mr. King, what is a tariff? It is a tax on imported goods. So what it does is it makes imported goods more expensive than American-made goods. Therefore, consumers, being reasonable people, will choose American goods over foreign goods. Now, the progressives, generally speaking, didn't like that because they saw that as artificial interference in the marketplace. If foreign goods are cheaper, let them come in. Let the American people purchase those cheaper goods. That's better for them. And then American companies would go on and figure out other things to make and produce. So that would, uh, uh, you know, that's how the economy was supposed to work according to progressives. Taft, however, initially supported lower tariffs, but he got tangled up in a political mess or melee in Congress with competing interests. And Taft sided with the wrong faction. That is, he sided with the politicians that wanted to protect American businesses and signed a bill raising tariff rates. And that was going to really, um, really cause a lot of people to doubt Taft, to question him, his integrity, and what he was about. Um, and we'll see that come up in the next um, election, which was the election of 1912. And you can see here on the screen a wonderful political cartoon that shows the four different candidates, the four men who ran for president. And I should have labeled them in the correct order. I didn't. I'm sorry. Um, but on the left, holding a moose, is Theodore Roosevelt, the ex-president. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt left the presidency in 1909 after serving almost two terms. He served uh, as uh, he served out President McKinley's first term uh, from 1901 to 1905. McKinley was assassinated, if you remember, and so he was not. He did not serve full two terms. So Roosevelt could have run for election again in 1909, but decided not to. He left politics. He thought Taft was going to be a good person to follow him. But it turns out that Taft, as I said earlier, did certain things that really upset people. So Roosevelt decided he wanted to get back into the political ring, and he wanted to become president. But the Republican Party, in its primaries, uh, elected to go with Taft despite all the uproar and dissension. But Roosevelt then, not getting the Republican uh, nomination to be their candidate for the president, decided to form his own party. And you see the icon of that party is, in fact, a moose. And Roosevelt's party was called the progressive, nicknamed Bull Moose Party. Moose are big, they're imposing, powerful animals. And that's kind of the figure that Roosevelt liked to cut. He wanted to be strong, authoritative, aggressive, uh, uh, bully people in, into accepting his ideas. So he forms this progressive party outside the Republican Party. The Republicans stick with Taft, although they're not excited about uh, uh, William Howard Taft. They didn't trust Roosevelt either because of his flamboyant character. So uh, you see seated on the iconic elephant of the Republican Party, William Howard Taft, Next to the elephant is the thin man, Rail Finn, uh, and this was Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate. And yes, there were socialists in the United States, and yes, they did run for president, though they never won, obviously. Uh, and then next to him on the donkey is Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate, who had come out of New Jersey, and he, he was the new governor of New Jersey, kind of similar to, you know, Chris Christie, the Republican governor of New Jersey, who's talked about running for president in uh, 2016. Woodrow Wilson came out of New Jersey, and in New Jersey, he won the reputation of being a great reformer in tackling some of the corrupt political machines in New Jersey and promoting reforms that would protect the people and small businesses against big businesses. So there you have the Wilson, the Democrat, who's going to tout his reformist uh, and progressive credentials. Um, moving on to the next slide, we can see what happened in the election of 1912, and it you can see the mathematical symbol of division, and it's called party division. So the Republican elephant got divided by the Bull Moose Progressive Party uh, of President Roosevelt or ex-President Roosevelt. 
and that led to Woodrow Wilson winning the election. Eugene Debs, the socialist, by the way, did uh, do well in the election, but he was a minor candidate who never really had any chance of winning a major uh, presidential election. You can see down below in the uh, map of the Electoral College, Woodrow Wilson really swept the slate of electoral votes. Uh, Roosevelt was green. The Bull Moose Party did, uh, I think, won eight states. And the actual sitting president, William Howard Taft, was completely embarrassed, winning only two states. I think you can see up there Vermont and uh, what looks to be like Utah. So um, what was really interesting then about the election of 1912 was the fact that the Republican Party split itself into two and allowed the Democrats to uh, cruise to victory. But there was also a, a great ideological uh, debate, and, and that really focused on um, Roosevelt and his ideas that he called new nationalism, which meant that there should be a more robust government presence in promoting different progressive ideas. And some of those progressive ideas are kind of interesting, and I'll just read a few of them to you. Um, Roosevelt felt that there should be a minimum wage for women working. He felt that all child labor should be banned, that workers who got sick and injured should receive some compensation from their employers, and that there should be a federal trade commission to regulate business, that women should have the right to vote, the suffrage, that is, and that the initiative, referendum and recall, from the progressive uh, movements in the states, particularly Wisconsin, should be brought to the national level. Uh, on the other hand, Woodrow Wilson promoted this idea of new freedom. He believed in using the, the powers of the government to attack privilege, and he felt like one of the areas of privilege was the tariff. The tariff privileged and protected American businesses. It should be done away with. The banks had always protected uh, the privileged wealthy elites. They should be regulated, and Woodrow Wilson is going to try to do that as president. And also the idea of, and I'm missing the third one, um, tariffs, banks, um, a oh, worker protection. Uh, Woodrow Wilson believed that uh, the workers deserve some uh, minimal level of protection. In addition to the trusts, that is the third, I'm sorry, the trusts. So you see here uh, President Wilson, who won the 1912 election, wielding a stick and a club, and he's going to be attacking the trusts and the tariffs and the privileged elites. Um, the other thing that Wilson did, too, was he, he really enlarged the office of president. He made the office of president more powerful. He said his goal was, when he took charge, was to be a big as a big a man as he can. And he really did follow through on that. And you can see that in the political cartoon. Though thin, uh, though a professor uh, in, in former life, he was a very active, engaged president. He was the first president to hold press conferences. And he restored the idea of the president presenting the State of the Union address to Congress directly. He often went to Congress to promote his ideas directly to the congressmen to persuade them. And he was, in fact, quite successful. Um, we're not going to look at the limits of progressivism today, so I'm going to pop back to that. I'm going to look at some of the, uh, the results that Wilson achieved. In 1913, he signed into law the Underwood Tariff Bill, which cut the tariff rate on many imported goods by half, and to replace the lost revenue by lowering the tariff rate, less revenue for the government, he got Congress to uh, uh, pass a bill uh, allowing for an income tax. So we have the nation's first permanent and graduated or progressive income tax. In 1913, uh, Woodrow Wilson reformed the banking system. Up to this time, uh, and from the 1830s, the United States did not have one central bank. There were thousands of banks operating, issuing paper money. There was no standard. The United States had returned to the gold standard in 1900, but there just simply wasn't enough gold to support the growth of the U.S. economy. There had been depressions and recessions in 1873, 1893, and 1907, which caused banks to close their doors. People lost their money. Wilson, uh, after charging... Congress, with an investigation that was carried out by Arsene Pujo, uh, really decided that we needed a national bank. Congress agreed, and they created what is known as the Federal Reserve System, a system of 12 regional banks that are overseen or directed by a board of directors appointed by the president. Uh, and today, this Federal Reserve still exists and regulates our money. 
President Wilson also uh, lobbied Congress to pass a new antitrust law known as the Clayton Antitrust Act. He created the Federal Trade Commission, uh, a Farm Loan Act, a, a Child Labor Act, uh, uh, an act creating an eight-hour workday, and many other things, and we'll stop here. Thank you.